outside of Sant'Andrea al Quirinale. I don't know how my Italian sounds. Perfect, is perfect. There. Uh, church by Bernini. A small church because there was not much space to build in. He was told by the Jesuits uh, that he should build and design uh, the architecture within this limited area. And he's done a magnificent thing. He's used what's called a giant order of architecture, which means that the steps that lead up to the church, uh, the porch, and the whole body of the church itself are enclosed within a single giant pilaster on each side and a huge elevation, which gives it a monumentality that really makes you forget how relatively small it is. He also has the steps spilling out into the street in a series of uh, concentric ovals like ripples. He loved movement, there's always movement in his architecture, which prepares us for the inside, as we will see the inside has an oval plan. Let's well, I, go inside. Absolutely, I can't wait to see it. So we've just entered into the church and we're in this beautiful oval form. And that's actually, as we walk in, it opens more broadly to our left and our right. It's a horizontal oval, uh, not what you expect. You'd expect, um, well, first of all, a church, a, rect a quadrangular space of some kind, a mm -hmm. cross-shaped space. And this too is something which could not have happened during the Renaissance. Uh, there would have been a circular plan. Mm -hmm. This is an oval one. And it's interesting to see that we'll come to an oval again and just actually, down the street with Borromini's often compared as a kind of rival to this. In some ways, it is uh, also San Carlino. Peter's, also, uh, St. Peter's Square. Uh, yes, which is elliptical. It, Actually, it's two well. ellipses. Yeah. And that sense of, well, it's like the difference between classical ballet and modern ballet. There's a sense of sort of expansion while keeping to certain symmetries. And this mm -hmm. is rigorously symmetrical. The, the thing that most strikes us as we go in is beyond and above the altar, we have light. It looks like theatrical light, but it's actually real light filtered in through a window that we can't see. And he does that. And he, he loves doing that. He does in the that St. In, in, yeah. in, in the St. Teresa and yeah. in St. Peter's. And it filters down on this group of tumbling while well, they're yes. moving up and down at the same time, uh, joyous uh, musical uh, angels and cherubs uh, set against massive rays of light. And they're made of stucco and gold go and bronze. Closer. Yes, sir. Well, as we approach the altar in the, the curve of the oval, and we have a richly appointed altar and seats and all of that, but we have a central painting of the martyrdom of St. Andrew. St. Andrea is St. Andrew in Italian. That is the dedicatee of the church. And he is very important in the Christian faith, not just for Catholics. He is the brother of St. Peter. So there are many churches dedicated to him in Rome. And he is the figure nailed to a X-shaped cross, which we call a St. Andrew's cross, and that is what is framed within these cherubs and angels and fictive but very solid rays of light. What's so, what's so interesting is that the painting itself is framed in the same marble as the, as the pilasters. pilasters. Yeah, so that it really is not a painting as we would normally understand it within an architectural space. Well, it's fully integrated. Again, it's that combination of solid and void, of rich material in sculpture and architecture and painting. It's, it is this complete work of art again and theatricality. And if we get too close, as it were, we're standing right in front of the altar and look up we see the source of that light that the congregation wouldn't normally see. And whether it's daylight or electric, but there is space for daylight, oh, that, that is gold. what bathes the area in light. This beautiful second lantern. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that, of course, is, is pure uh, theatrical expedient. The color of the columns and the pilasters and the gorgeous colors of the different stone materials that were used to build this church are uh, earthly colors. Uh, some people have compared these columns to, uh, well, I would think of prosciutto maybe. Uh, some people say hamburger meat. We're not being flippant. We're looking at uh, browns and whites and streaks of what would be the fat in the, in the, in the prosciutto. But this relates to food in, in, in a perfectly serious way. That is something of the earth. All of that gives way when your eyes are taken up into the vaulting of the whole church to pure colors and they are heavenly colors down below it's earth up above it's only white and gold and those are the colors of paradise and as we'll see saint andrew uh, dying on the cross in the painting uh, yields to a statue actually exploding out of the level down below into the upper level and that is a white statue and he's being carried up to heaven and that gold in the lantern 
Yes, it's well, that, just... that gold is enhanced, of course, by having stained glass, a, a mm -hmm. simple, a simple yeah. expedient, uh, ancient and modern. We simply yeah. use glass that is, in this case, yellow. So even on a, on a cloudy day like today, it gives this sense of a glow of the Holy Spirit the above. Heavenly. And that is what is shown in that in the lantern, center. the very top of the building. Mm -hmm. What I'm really taken by is the way that the structural ribs of the dome are structured as rays that emanate from the dove. It's, it's a two-way thing, and it, 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 you've hit it on the head. It's, it both emanates from that dove and brings us divine grace, which comes from the Holy Spirit and inspiration, but also it leads the eye upward. Whichever yes. way you look at it, it yes. works to go from this very decorated oval shape that we have below to something that resolves into, as I said, pure gold and white and light. And that vaulting, the, the dome itself, which is also oval, is full of people in white. Now, they're made of stucco. These are statues of both men and boys. The boys, of course, are little cherubs. We can see them in the angels. The men are fishermen, and they have nets. And this is to remind us that Andrew was a fisherman, like his brother, St. Peter. They're the first two apostles who were called to the ministry by Jesus of Nazareth. And some of the figures seem to be sort of moving from the lantern down. Yes, in the Renaissance, uh, well, let's say 150 years before this, Mantegna's famous mm -hmm. uh, view Camera through Sposi. Camera degli Sposi, the, the, the view up or down, according to which way you look at it, included figures that look down on us, and we have yes. the illusion yeah. that we're being observed just as we observe exactly. them. And this does that perfectly. We have this dissolving of the earthly and the spirituals by having figures midway between one and the other, and none is more obvious, St. Andrew himself, who stands in a white statue in the broken pediment. Yes. And the pediment is broken so that he can be released from earth up to heaven where he is going. And there's that fabulous contrast then between the, the suffering of Andrew in the painting and then the spiritual representation. The spiritual release and eternity. And uh, remember uh, that everyone at that time would have believed in death as something that is almost comforting. We referred to this in the Jesu, this God's time is the best time. Whoever says the that, release it's from Martin the body. Luther, of course, the release. And the absence of what we now have is fear and apprehension and even terror of death, because we don't think much about the afterlife. Everyone was sure that they were going to an eternal place, not of ultimate happiness. You had to work your way through, and that's what purgatory is for, and as long as you weren't going to hell. But it was a certainty, and it was something that was seen as better than this life. And death was, of course, ubiquitous because of infant mortality, recurrent yeah. outbreaks people of lived plague. With it. In people a way, we lived don't. with it. We absolutely don't. We don't even like to talk about it. That's right. And this kind of painting and sculpture and architecture is also reassuring and comforting yeah. even. It sounds paradoxical, but no. about death. About yeah. while it's not death, it's a new life. That's right. I think often about that when we see images of saints or the death of Christ or the death of Mary, being at a deathbed was not Unusual, yeah. you know, well, something this, that, that, that they could, they that could relate to that. We're going to, I'm going to show you now uh, the ultimate deathbed in Rome. Let's go see. Uh, and that is a statue upstairs behind the church. Let's go there. <laughs> 